do you think he would wish to be king? There was always conflict on that subject with him when we discussed it. And I understood that conflict because it's a very demanding role, being Prince of Wales. But it's equally a more demanding role, being king. And being Prince of Wales produces more freedom now. And being king would be a little bit more suffocating. And because I know the character, I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. This is BBC One. We've interrupted our programmes for a news report. We now go over to Martin Lewis in the news studio. We interrupt this film to tell you we are getting reports that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been badly injured in a car crash in France. French radio is saying that the accident happened in western Paris when the car she was travelling in collided with another vehicle in a tunnel. The princess is reported to have been taken to hospital. There is no news of her condition, and as yet the report is unconfirmed. It's also reported that a passenger in the princess's car was killed. One report, quoting French police, says it is her friend, Dodi al Fayed. It's also reported that the driver of the princess's car was killed. From NBC News, this is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Reporting tonight from London. Good evening from London, from Buckingham Palace, where tonight this nation and the world heard still more troubling news as it prepares for the funeral Saturday of Princess Diana. French authorities say the driver of her car, her car, was legally drunk at the time of the high-speed fatal crash, news that only deepened the sadness of her passing. All this week, her body will lie behind closed doors at St. James Palace. Then... Westminster Abbey on Saturday, what the palace calls a unique funeral for a unique person. Your candles burned out long before Your legend ever I welcome this kind of examination. We came and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. A new world order. A new world order. You saw? If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species, from another planet, outside in the universe. I always talk to you like the other day. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House! He died. Died. But that's a wicked woman. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. You can keep it. Period. 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 They are the focus of evil in the modern world. It's a catastrophe. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. This is the Midnight Rider News Podcast. 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 Hello, America. And the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm Esty Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state sponsor talking heads, court historians, and textbook conglomerates that control information today. Tonight we have episode 021 The Princess Diana Conspiracy. Our guest tonight will be Alan Power, the author of The Princess Diana Conspiracy, The Evidence of Murder. He'll join us next in the Midnight Hour. First, a little cleaning of the castle. Our Facebook page is at Midnight Writer News Show. Please like us and follow us there. I, as of yet, still have no personal Facebook page, and frankly, I'm trying not to care. Our Twitter is MWN underscore ST Patrick. And please, if you have a suggestion, a comment, a question, please send it to our email at midnightwriternews at gmail.com. I do answer that email, so that's the best way to contact me at this point. For our new Jim Mars booklet released to us by Galaxy Press, please go to midnightwriternews.com where it can be both read and downloaded. For those of you who found us through kennedysandking.com, jfkfacts.org, or the Corbett Report, I want to personally say hello and thank you. I would suggest that you look at our free downloadable show archives, which also can be found at MidnightRiderNews.com. I'm really proud of the work that we've done up to this point, and I believe that you'll enjoy it as well. So please check out the archives on the site. Thanks. And we'll be right back with Alan Power and the Princess Diana Conspiracy.
When did the CIA begin importing drugs into the United States? What is the MK Ultra program, and how did LSD affect its implementation? Was Sirhan Sirhan a victim of CIA mind control? Did Kurt Cobain have a CIA asset in his own home? And what was Tupac's radicalized political background? How did the CIA's war against influential pop culture icons result in the deaths of Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Brian Jones, John Lennon, Bob Marley, Kurt Cobain, and Tupac Shakur? Hi, this is John Podash. If you want to know more about the CIA's murders targeting of STS, Black Panthers, download episode 6 of the Midnight Writer News Show with S.T. Patrick. Diana Spencer was born July 1st, 1961. Her name became known worldwide in February of 1981 when her engagement to Charles, the Prince of Wales, and eldest son to Queen Elizabeth II, was announced. The wedding on July 29, 1981, was viewed globally by more than 750 million people. Tales of a troubled marriage appeared early in the British tabloids, but as the years went by, the dissatisfaction became more noticeable as well as more public. Both Charles and Diana actively engaged in extramarital affairs, despite having two sons, William and Harry, also successors to the throne. Charles and Diana were legally divorced in August of 1996, before on August 31, 1997, a car carrying Diana and Dodi Al-Fayed collided with another vehicle in a tunnel in Paris. Diana, Fayed, and the driver of the car, Henri Paul, were all killed. Many believe that the car crash was not just that, a simple tragic car crash. One of those who believe there is much more to the story than the official version would have us to believe is Alan Power. In 2014, Alan Power released the culmination of his research, The Princess Diana Conspiracy, The Evidence of Murder. He joins the Midnight Rider News Show tonight to discuss his work regarding the death of Diana. How are you doing tonight, Alan? I'm well, so how are you doing? So, Alan, I can remember the night of August 31st, 1997 so well. I was a senior in college, and I can even remember exactly where I sat as I watched the late breaking news. Yeah. What are your own memories of that night, and what do you remember about your own first reactions? Well, it was late morning, my last time over here. Um, it was, um, uh, I had a cold, and I went to a separate bedroom in the house to uh, leave my wife safe from contamination. And uh, she came into the bedroom for me in the morning about four, six o'clock, and said that I had been uh, killed in a car crash. So uh, that was my recollection of it. Let's begin with a bit of biographical information. Who was Diana? Why did she marry Charles? You know, I can even remember thinking that day, the day they got married in 1981, I can remember thinking, boy, for somebody who's about to marry a potential king of England, she does not look very happy. So was she unhappy even by that point? Uh, yes, she was ultimately, because she was conned all the way through right in the beginning. Um, at the time she got to know Charles, he was following her around, because he'd been told by Prince Philip he had to have a, a wife that was young, uh, virginal, uh, could produce offspring for the succession of the monarchy, uh, and her sole role was to be uh, married for uh, and to produce offspring uh, to keep the monarchy um, going, as it were. Um, there's no one left otherwise to do it. I mean, Camilla Parker Bowles, who married before, had children already. Um, she wasn't suitable to be a, a queen, and uh, they would accept her. And he was all, Charles was already in love with Camilla. So he didn't stop going out with her. He went out with her first, uh, since 1977, um, he was, uh, he's fallen in love with her. Uh, then she married uh, Parker Bowles, um, Andrew Parker Bowles, uh, and the, she, he never changed his, his feelings about that. He never, ever, he admitted he never, ever loved Diana. It was purely a means of just getting offspring for the children. And even the Archbishop of Canterbury, who ran the ceremony at the wedding, admitted that he knew Diana uh, wasn't loved by the royal family, certainly by Charles, and she was there for purposes of breeding, and that was it. Regarding the royal family and their relationship with Diana, okay. was she ultimately um, hated or despised by anyone else within the family, or was this a singular, isolated problem with Charles and only Charles? Yes, I mean, the whole setup was quite disgraceful. The whole family knew exactly why she'd been married. They all knew that Charles didn't love her, um, they knew that she was going to be discarded at some point. Philip even said to Charles, after about six months, that he could leave Diana after about five years when he had a few children to uh, satisfy the needs of the monarchy. So it, they all knew exactly what they were doing. They knew they were destroying her life. They knew that they were using her purely for one purpose. 
and the, she was basically going to be she was a 19 year old girl just 20 when they got married just I mean, a few weeks four weeks into being 20 and she was just basically going to be cast away cast aside where she produced the children so there was no start on the beginning what the purpose was now it's my understanding Alan that even when Diana first thought about leaving Charles even her own parents were not supportive uh, that's true. They knew it was uh, a very dangerous uh, thing to be considering. Diana, in all fairness, there's not much doubt about it, was, um, uh, had rose to the glasses about being a member of the royal family. The fact she became Queen of England was you know, forefront of her mind. For a young girl, it was quite a, quite a thought. Um, and that's what really drew her into it. She knew there were some things that weren't quite right. She even knew, before they went and had the wedding ceremony, that she should withdraw, she should back off. And she was told by her sister that um, it was too late now. Her face was on the tea towels. She had to go through her. So there was no support from her family at all. Who was Muhammad al-Fayed? Uh, Muhammad al-Fayed is still around. He's, um, uh, he's a, an Egyptian businessman who most of it made his money in Dubai. Um, he's a billionaire. He used to own Harrods and the um, uh, one of the soccer clubs. And then, which one was that now? The, I forgot the soccer club. Um, I wanted to finish a ball. I played rugby football, not uh, <laughs> soccer. Um, he, he had this um, uh, interest all over the world. He had the this rich hotel in Paris. Uh, he had a castle in Scotland. He had a big house down in the south of England. A house over in uh, Saint Tropez. A house in Switzerland. And one in um, Finland, where his wife uh, comes from. Now, Mohammed Al Fayed owned a hotel in Paris. Is that correct? That's the Ritz Hotel. Yeah. The Ritz Hotel. Yes. Yeah. So before we get back to the Fayeds. Who is Dr. Khan? Dr. Hasnad Khan uh, was or is a Brompton Hospital um, heart specialist. Uh, he's um, Pakistani and he um, is still in, in, still in London, I do believe. I'm not sure he's moved up. He's still there. And he was uh, basically met Diana when she was looking at meeting some of the patients in Brompton Hospital. Going to visit them, and she just felt that she felt for him, and he obviously likes her a great deal as well, and they struck up a relationship. And she had a, a good relationship with him. He's apparently quite a, yeah, I don't know a great deal about it, but I do know that uh, they were fond of one another. And I think she was more fond of him than he was of her. And then the reality was that he said he couldn't stand the pressure and the te- the, the, the publicity that, that he would be able to survive the publicity with his job. Uh, as a heart specialist, um, if he was going out with Diana and living in Kensington Palace, as Diana suggested to him that he should. So he was um, always a bit on the um, unlikely side as a, as a candidate for a partner. Now, Alan, it seems to be the conventional wisdom recently in all the documentaries that have come out that Diana really wanted to marry Dr. Khan, but you don't agree with that, is that correct? No, it's absolutely rubbish. Absolutely, of course, yes, I do. It's, you know, Hasn't it Khan has actually said himself that uh, made a statement in the press that uh, he met Diana for the last time in Battersea Park in London. And as she was walking towards him, this was um, a matter of a week, ten days before, she finally went off to, um, uh, with Dirty Fired to the south of France. And he said she, he knew that she'd gone to another man. He could tell. So you've known them for two years, you could tell their vibes, their mood, their, 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 their demeanour. And he, and he knew straight away when he saw her that when she walked over towards him, uh, that this was for the last time, and she had gone to another man. There's no question about it. She was not wanting to go back to Hazard Car at all. She made a decision about going with Dodie Fayed. Right, and what do you think it was about Dodie Fayed that was attractive to Diana? Well, the, the reality, I think, is we have to be realistic about this, and rather than just look on the gloss side of it. Um, you know, it's nice to think she was madly in love, he was madly in love. I think, without a doubt, they were extremely fond of them. The degree of affection I've got absolutely no idea about it wasn't long enough to take a reading on that. But they were very fond of one another, very fond indeed. And Fayed was um, a very wealthy boy. I mean, he wasn't himself wealthy. His father was wealthy, and he was going to have an awful lot of money. And his father gave him a, very lot, a lot of cash. He was very supportive of, uh, of his son. So he, she knew that she had to have someone who was going to be able to look after her, look after security, look after children, and who wanted children around, around him. And she could trust and rely on. And she had this rapport going with him all the world. So he's the right sort of person to take on the monarchy and defend herself or have someone defend her um, from the monarchy when she made this move. And she knew the monarchy would not want the children 
uh, Carl, uh, sorry, uh, William and Harry to leave the country. It would have been imperative to them. They stayed behind. There was this big thing going in Britain about all the monarchy and all the family be controlled by the security services, by uh, MI6. And everything has to be watched very carefully indeed. And if they'd left the country, they were thinking of coming to the States, to California, to live. If they'd gone over there, they'd have had to rely upon other, maybe fired guys, to look after her security and the royal security. And they didn't think that was at all reasonable. In fact, the Queen Elizabeth came out on television uh, and made a statement that it was not going to happen. Uh, the children were not going to leave the country. That's almost within a day or so of Diana making the suggestion she would like perhaps to leave. Speaking of wanting to have a child, I watched a clip of you on Geraldo, and you were debating a so-called royals expert, whatever that expression means, <laughs> and she was saying that Diana was absolutely not pregnant at the time of the crash, yeah. but you argued that she was. Right. The, um, first of all, about Imogen Lloyd Webber, Andrew Lloyd Webber's daughter, um, certainly, she's MI6. She's uh, spent, um, she was at Cambridge, the Catholic College of Cambridge, specialised in history, with a special interest in the, the, the role of security services throughout the world. And that was her degree. <laughs> uh, she's solid behind MI6. Um, and she, um, well, she, she, she was doing her job to try and counter me. Uh, I'll tell you more about that in a moment if you want. But as far as the um, about knowing it's concerned, I tracked down um, uh, a lady called uh, Dr. Elizabeth Dion, who's a French radiologist, and she said in an affidavit the police finally got off about nine years. Uh, for years, all those years, they couldn't find her. A uh, reporter and I both found her. I took me nine days to find her without a police force. Uh, I spoke to her three times on the phone. Uh, very nice lady indeed. And I was asking her about the affidavit, which was a three-liner, not mentioning a child or a fetus, not mentioning uh, where she really was that night. She said she was actually working, she got a job in San Francisco. Now, we don't know, she didn't say where she was that night. She didn't know, she didn't mention the fetus. And the other three lines just said she got a job in San Francisco and that she was working there as a visiting professor. That was it. Nothing at all. So she ducked out saying anything about the fetus. And I asked her, how would friends of yours say that you saw that they, that you said you had seen um, a thesis in Diana's um, corpse, basically, um, after the crash? And she said, well, yes, uh, yes, uh, they did say that, um, but the, basically there must have been a mix-up of the rosa that night. And I said, hang on a minute, um, if you were in the States, how could you have been on a French rosa? She didn't say a word, silence. Right, Exactly. So at what point do you think Diana knew that she was um, potentially in danger? I think she knew it all along, basically, that she was under extreme pressure. Uh, she knew she'd have a problem. She wrote a dossier about the sex exploits of the royal family as a form of protection for herself. Um, she knew she was going to be under a great deal of pressure to keep the children or to not take the children away. And that was actually crucial to the royal family she didn't take the children abroad. Um, so they keep a, an eye on the children while they're growing up. Um, she knew she was in danger from the moment she knew that they were going to part company. They were definitely going to separate and divorce. And so she knew she had to have some means of defending herself against the monarchy, the, the establishment. She had, she had the MI6, she had the monarchy, and to a certain extent as well the government against her. She was pretty much on her own. It was very, very tough going. So what she had to do was to try and get... Um, some secure her position. Once she got the dossier, it put her in serious danger um, because they were saying an awful lot about the family's royal family's skeletons. Or any one or a certain a number of them would have destroyed the family, finished them off. So she, they, she was in serious pressure there. She knew that when her husband had written a letter saying that um, she was, um, he, he, there was, I'm oh, sorry, no, eight one, no, I ran, that's another issue. Diana uh, wrote a letter saying that. Uh, Charles was planning to kill her in a, in a car accident um, to, so she's free to go and marry elsewhere. Um, now, if she knew that, she said that, she wrote it down, it was all there. So she wasn't just paranoid at this time. I mean, she'd seen the paperwork and she had already been threatened with an accident. Is that correct? Yes, she had. Um, the uh, a guy called Nicholas Sertens, uh, Winston Churchill's grandson, matter of fact, uh, but he 
uh, was at. You see, Fern Kensington Palace, when she when Diana was there, with Simon Simmons, uh, her clairvoy and friend, uh, and this four core came through from, um, from Nicholas Soames, uh, threatening her that she could, that people do have accidents. She didn't stop meddling in affairs that didn't concern her. Uh, he was talking about all sorts of things, the, the, the um, um, issue with um, landmines, uh, the issue with the children with the attacking the Charles Windsor, the whole bit. Um, what he, Nicholas did was to actually claim on television that Diana was paranoid, which was an absolute load of rubbish. She wasn't paranoid at all. She knew exactly what they were doing, what they were trying to achieve with her. Um, and so she was a place she just defends it. She had to defend herself. She had to go on the offensive against the royal family to defend herself or people at the end of thinking she was paranoid, and she wasn't. Oh, wow. Now let's take the story into Paris, Island, and specifically the Ritz Hotel. Who are John McNamara and Frank J. Klein? McNamara, uh, John McNamara, uh, was um, a uh, chief inspector of police um, in Scott Scotland Yard, and he left and became Mohammed Al Fayed's security chief. Frank Klein was the president of the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Uh, I believe he still is, and I suppose we asked about three years ago he was still the president there, so I'm, I presume he still is. Um, Basically, that was it, and they were both there trying to hunt down uh, the, the background, the detail, the fear, you know, all sorts of stuff, to try and get their own separate private investigation going, but they didn't trust the police. Then the police would try and mask everything to keep all the truth away from the people. The people knew the truth, and as uh, John Stevens, who was the then boss, or sorry, well, later the boss of them of um, Southern Yard, he said... But if this was an uh, if this was an assassination, the consequences in Britain would be great and incalculable. And he denied saying that in court. There's a chunk of that in my book which illustrates it was said, and there's some evidence that it was as well. Well, that was a disaster. So tell us what happened at the hotel before they get into the car, before Dodie and Diana get into the car. How did they decide upon what the exit strategy would be? Well, um, they were under pressure. They were going to go from the hotel. At, uh, uh, who said, who said, um, who say, the apartment that Dodie had uh, near the, um, uh, the, up the end of the Champs de Libre, by the Arc de Triomphe, he, he was coming there with, he was there with Diana. They were going to leave and go to a, a restaurant uh, called Chez Benoit, um, but they, they, they booked it, and they were going there towards there, and they found lots of paparazzi already outside the Chez Benoit. So they knew, somehow they'd found out, where they were going. So it's likely, in my view, this is not proven, so I'm, I'm stating this when I say I haven't got the proof of this, but it's highly probable, I think, that the route they were taking was identified by six, MI6, um, so they let it be known to Paparazzi uh, where they were going to be to make sure they didn't go in, because they had a big uh, ruck, you know, f- 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 rack going on outside the restaurant. They wouldn't go into the restaurant, they wouldn't be able to. They'd go out to the Ritz Hotel, and they wanted them at the Ritz Hotel. They want them there, they can control it, they've got all the debugging devices in place, they're all secure where they can say exactly what's going on during the course of the evening. When they got back to the hotel, they went inside and uh, they went to the Imperial Suite and they had a meal and they tried this in the restaurant first of all, uh, but then the, there was so much attention there, you know, people gazing at them and stuff, they left and went upstairs to the, um, the main suite and they stayed up there until they left the hotel. Um, but what happened first of all was they decided uh, they were thinking of staying another night and they thought no we want to go back and Daddy wanted to go back to the, his apartment and he was going to, he was going to um, propose to Diana that night and he had the ring waiting for her back at the um, back at his apartment so he had a discussion with um, uh, with Henri Paul um, about driving the car for them because they would say not get anybody warned that they were going to do this this way or he would keep it to himself that he was going to be driving the car then nobody else would know what was going to happen in advance and then they discussed this and then the, the bodyguards uh, made out they didn't really know what was happening uh, and then they thought maybe it was a last minute decision but in fact they knew and this, again this is proven this in my book um, that basically they just had um, you know, they knew what was going on they were out the back door um, and they went to the back together twice before. Once only about um, four or five weeks earlier, uh, when they were in Paris for a, a long weekend. And they went there for the back door for the same reason, to avoid the paparazzi. 
So they've done it before, they've been tried and tested groups of doing it. So that's where they were going from there, and I can see a lot more about cars and stuff, so if you want more. Yes, why were there no security guards at the back door of the hotel? The, well, no one knew they were going out there. Um, it was, well, they had security in the sense that um, we had um, Trevor East Jones, who went in the car with them, who was there when they had the crash in the, in the tunnel, and um, Winfield was also uh, there as well, seeing the guard them into the car. So there was a security there, and it was the fire's own security, security guys took them out of the back door into the car. Um, and so Trevor East Jones went with, uh, with the car. With the car. Uh, so they were there. Let's talk about Henri Paul. Now, though he drove Diana and Dodie that night, he was a security guard. He was not a full-time driver, correct? Correct. No, he wasn't. Okay, now the story was that Henri Paul was heavily intoxicated, as we heard Tom Brokaw describe in our opening clip. Now, you argue that that's not the case. <laughs> no, no. It's, you're picking all the lies I did in the <laughs> <laughs> Um <laughs> no, I mean, absolute load of rubbish again. They, they, even, in, even in the inquest, Scott Baker had to concede, first of all, concede that the, the evidence was very, was, was very dubious. They're not sure where the, the Blossom's memory report came from. He admitted that in court. Um, all sorts of, he wasn't sure he couldn't explain the 25-30% of carbon monoxide in his blood. All sorts of stuff. But they let the evidence stand in court, of course. They had one purpose, and that was to get the verdict of... Um, uh, well, unlawful killing, but not a murder. Because uh, that was a guarantee that it was MI6. It was a de facto admission or conviction for MI6, if they called it murder. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the car. How did they choose the car that night? They didn't choose the car. Uh, the car was already chosen for them. It had been uh, owned by uh, by Musa, the guy who owned the Etoile Limousine uh, car, hire company. And basically, they just used them all the time. And this car they had, it was stolen three months earlier. Uh, it had been take, it taken to bits um, and then put back together again. And when they actually got the car, they found the car afterwards. It leaked out that the uh, computer chip that controls the steering and the, 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 um, and the brakes wasn't working. Sorry, it wasn't there. And the brakes weren't working. They were, the lights were flickering in the car before they left the rest of the so after the ambulance arrived at the crash site, it took another hour and a half to get Diana to the hospital. Even though, as, as we know now, there was a trauma doctor in the tunnel who was dismissed when the ambulance arrived. So why was the trauma doctor told to leave the scene, and why did it take another hour and a half to get Diana, Dodie, and Henri to the hospital? Right. Well, now this is a tricky one, because the, the truth is that... I work on evidence and facts of detail rather than on supposition because that's anyone can go along and read. You can read the transcripts and you know, draw your own conclusions. Um, but I've done is research it from the years I spent before the inquest even came up and compare the evidence and cross reference it. And that's why I must say they like me very much because um, I can prove them. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry I was sidetracking there, but the, the, you can't really, it's not possible to really. Uh, quite said that that was okay. It was longer than one would hope and expect. But remember, first of all, the big difference is in France, the um, ambulances over there carry not only paramedics, they call a doc, they carry a doctor on board, and with a sort of small um, uh, theatre on board the hospital, uh, the ambulance as well. So it's not like they are in the UK or the US where it's uh, grab them and go rush to the hospital uh, with paramedics. In, the, in France, they, they treat them. They often do treat them um, at, at the absence scene. So that may well have been part of it. You, you can't start condemning people because it didn't work how we would have liked it to work. Uh, the time factor it was a bit dubious, but the uh, Pitié uh, Pitié Saint Petrier Hospital was the best equipped hospital for this particular trauma and injury. Uh, they believe that's why they went there rather than passing the other two hospitals in the way. Now we can all start you know, elaborating on this. And there may well have been something going on, but there's no evidence of it. But another thing is also, quite recently, you may not have known this, but about um, uh, six, eight weeks ago, over here, a man who's dying in hospital uh, came uh, on the news. Um, his name is John Hopkins, and he's an ex-MI5, not six, MI5, that's Homeland Security, um, assassin. He admitted to murdering 23 people, and that Diana was the only one he'd murdered. Uh, he admitted that he's also specialist in poisons. Now, when I've written another book called The um, uh, State of Evil, which has been actually squashed again like the other one, 
uh, the Apeless Diet Conspiracy. Um, this guy, uh, I've put in my book, I, I knew from evidence on the peripheral side of things that what happened. And I've said that the guy, and I've called him Atkinson in my book, not, not Hopkins, um, he was lurking in the tunnels, waiting. They knew what was happening. It was all planned. And they were waiting over there, and with a syringe of whatever, probably fentanyl or some such thing, a massive dose, over there, rush over, in, in the car, see if you could see any problem, if you could help, and then shove the needle in and inject. Then they knew whatever happened, she wasn't going to make it. That was it. So the fatal moment, how does the actual crash occur? They were coming down towards the, under the um, Alexander Bridge, and then that was the um, uh, Alma Tunnel, <coughs> excuse me, and they had um, um, the, the cars, the cars parked on the right side of the road, people on the side of the road were seen, and reported. Uh, no one inside this tunnel was reported at this point, but they would have obviously kept out of the way. Um, there was a car lurking, loitering, the word used, um, the Fiat Uno, the white one, uh, at the tunnel entrance. Now, all these cars were just moving, just getting in the place, position at the right time. The car was coming along. And as the car, the Mercedes, came towards the tunnel, the Fiat accelerated, went driving towards the car, and there was a massive flash of light. And it's described by a few people as being uh, like a military strobe light um, to blind the driver of the car. <coughs> Excuse me. And the um, the um, uh, fierce then ran into the side of the car. Now we think it was pro- most probably a glancing off. It wasn't intended to happen. But then we also have evidence from a separate report done has been squashed since that the car was the fierce followed the Mercedes further in, rapidly accelerated and rammed it again, and then drove a bit further on. And there was a car just in front of the Fiat, who was um, a lady called uh, Musa, uh, sorry, um, Mufakir, Mufakir, and Suad Mufakir, and she was with her, her boyfriend at the time, they've since got married, uh, and they were driving just ahead of the Mercedes, and the Fiat came ramming between um, the Mercedes and the, the car that uh, um, um Mufakir's husband was driving. And then they drove off, and the Fiat, after they'd seen the car spin around in the mirror, real mirror, the Fiat drove past them, and uh, Suad saw the, the driver's face. Now, this time there, was, there were no paparazzi, no one in sight. She was also asked the same question in tri- the inquest uh, what, hap- um, what did you see behind? And she said, Well, I saw some more lights coming and approaching the tunnel. And she said, she said, uh, quite far behind. So they said, how far? So they were quite far, far behind. So it was about another minutes at least, or 90 seconds, before the vehicles arrived at the tunnel, on the tunnel entrance. Uh, and then, you know, there was not only that, but we've had evidence too from other people, the doctors who were around, who say when they got there first, there were no paparazzi anywhere in sight. Nobody. Uh, it was just, and then they, you know, that was obviously just after. Uh, BFS was done their job, the nasty work. Uh, then they came over to see what they could do to help. Uh, then the ambulances, the, the fire engines, first of all, um, turned up. And all this stuff happened uh, way before the... Um, sorry, the, sorry big one, that's wrong. Um, the, the, these guys were in the tunnel, and they saw the crash, uh, after, saw the car after the crash. They saw what was going on at the time. There was no fire around at all. The fire came later. And then the um, firings and stuff arrived after that, about seven or eight minutes later. So it was all happening. Uh, by the time the firings got there, the paparazzi were there. They were taking photographs. And the other vehicles that had been there when the car hit the wall had gone. Right. Now, Alan, the mainstream story is that there are cameras in the tunnel, but that that night they weren't operable. Yeah, that's another one. The, again, it's one I've stayed clear of, um, only because... I mean, it's very suspicious indeed, and we know that someone has actually said, it's anecdotal information, it's not uh, firm evidence, that someone saw, um, someone drove into the tunnel 25 minutes before the crash and got a speeding ticket from the camera. Very obvious, it's going to happen, and amazingly, to turn off just before the Mercedes entered the tunnel. (laughs) Yes, Alan, it seems like these stories are rife with coincidence. Now, let's talk about the monarchy. It takes them four days to make a statement. Why? Well, again, I'm in the ground here where I have very good theories and some justification for it, but not hard evidence. See, I know for a fact that, because I know some people who work at the palace, and I know that that evening, um, 
when they were up in Balmoral, when that happened, the accident occurred, um, the Queen left her matter with a bedchamber and didn't go back for quite some time. Um, my honest belief is, and this is my view, my entire view, is that uh, Philip had given the order to MI6, the nod, shall we say, um, the Queen looked at him when she heard the news, knew straight away what had happened, left the bedroom, left the, the bedroom, and uh, went to look after the kids, and that was in the bed for ages. Uh, and that's it, because she would not, in my view, have approved this happening at all. Hmm, really? Now, one thing I'm curious about, Alan, and it's something I'll probably remain curious about for, I'll say, the next 10 to 15 years, is whether or not William and Harry have questions or doubts about what happened to their mother. Now, do you have any inside information regarding William and Harry in regards to specific doubts or specific questions they may have? Um, yeah, they, I mean, they, they've always had questions about it. Um, but, and again, I'm here on... Um, and I always say to the front when it's not categorical evidence, it's um, my view. Uh, they had to tell William what happened, because it was just, he was going to find that anyway. Um, they had to get him on side, and very hard to do that. Now, Harry is a different kettle of fish. And recently, he's, um, uh, I've got his email address, and we've communicated a bit, and uh, sitting on very quiet on me. Um, I think it's because Harry uh, had been persuaded by his brother, by William, uh, that he's got to support the royal family because the royal family now is probably in greater peril right now than it, had, it was after the crash. Um, it's the point where the people now in this country being think, what the hell do you want a monarchy for? And the thing about having William and Harry was the main future, the hope for the monarchy. Now we've got Harry, say first of all, it was a dreadful thing to ask 12 year old to walk behind the coffin uh, up the mound to the. Uh, to the uh, uh, funeral service, and uh, the whole lot, the people all start, all these, these, these security services so-called, start looking all ways in which they can fabricate stories and lean in a certain direction to suit themselves, um, and they, he said, Harry said, it was dreadful to expect him to do that, it was bloody awful, um, but now it's in the last few days, he's come out and said that he's correct, he's thankful he was there, and of course he means generally perhaps there, at the funeral service, rather than walking behind the coffin. He didn't specify that. But he started to come out and make some comments that are more supportive of the monarchy. Um, now, if that happens, in my view, and this, if they don't win this, if we breach this barrier and get through, uh, that is the end of the monarchy. They enhance the end of it because their only hope of survival is those two lads. And if they are now abandoned in Diana, and go in that way as well, then that's going to be the end of it. Now, I would tell you, Alan, that you know that you're right when you start to be attacked by those in power, those in authority. Now, you've certainly not had an easy road riding the Princess Diana conspiracy, so tell us a little bit about that. Right, I'm not sure we've got long enough, but I'll, I'll keep it as brief as I can. Um, when I started writing this book, I was in North Wales, and currently in the Isle of Man, it's a little island in the Irish Sea. Um, and the reason for being over here is quite simply because it's a separate police force, independent. And I, was, I had a complaint from, you know, I went to Kensington Palace in London about three or four months ago, and within a matter of weeks, a couple of weeks, the uh, Scotland Yard Royal Protection Group had phoned the Alamand Police complain about my going to Kensington Palace. Um, what's got to do with them? I have no idea. Um, but basically, that's the sort of reason why, if I've been living in England, uh, they wouldn't bother phoning anybody, they just turned up on the doorstep. Um, so it's, it's pretty difficult with all that. I was in North Wales writing the book. Um, I had, uh, first of all, notified Fayed myself, I'm going to see him in 2008, 2009, actually it was in November 2009. Uh, it, was, it was a very nice lunch at um, the Georgian restaurant in Harrods. Uh, I met John McNamara there. Um, the um, the, what happened then was that after that, Scotland Yard got to know about me. Then the police started taking an interest, and I'm not sure the security service was directly involved then. I imagine they probably were. And they were following me around. They had, I had a friend of mine who was a police officer close by who um, goes and runs, wanted to go and runs around the, the Welsh hill there. And he spotted some people climbing a telegraph pole one day. He said, with suits on. It was a bit strange. So he ran back down the hill, and as he ran back down the hill, they were jumping in the car and zooming off. He always carried a notepad on him. He made a note of the car number. Back at the office, it didn't exist. The car didn't exist. 
uh, numbers that exist. Uh, and then I had um, helicopter, khaki, unmarked khaki helicopter, hovering close to my house uh, as well. And as I looked it up and they turned out to face me, I waved and it flew off. Um, I've had people on the Isle of Man coming over on the ferry, there and back, one behind me, one to my side, two different ones on the way back. Uh, six weeks later, the one guy, the large one, uh, who's sitting behind me, was walking down my drive, um, and two guys in the back of his car. Um, so I went outside to meet them, uh, and we had a little conversation, and uh, uh, he was obviously <laughs> uh, trying to see whether they could actually you know, make a move on me. I had a reason which I can't repeat why he couldn't get away with that, so he disappeared. Um, then I've had uh, a text saying, we challenge you to pursue your idea. I've had um, an attack on the house, I believe. Again, this is not evidence, but on April the 19th, 13, just for the book is due to be published, my wife died of a heart attack in my arms. Uh, my, my wife, my mother downstairs, uh, went into a room and collapsed about uh, 10, 12 days later, and then she was taken to the hospital, never came back to the house, and I had a massive attack of shingles all over my back. Uh, weeks so after that, my doctor says the worst he'd ever seen in his life. Uh, that all had, now, I also know a thing called Pandora, where they have this microwave system they attack people with. They're not going to shoot them these days. Uh, they just attack them in a different way in time, put this pressure on from different areas. Um, all sorts of stuff, I and mean, that could go on and on. I had a guy who well, came over from England to the Isle of Man, it's probably the most interesting one. There's two weeks of the book was published in uh, August 13. Uh, his name was Patrick Condon. And he was already on the aircraft, sitting on it, waiting for me. When I got on the aircraft, got up and let me in. I was in the inside seat. He was in the aisle seat. It was a small aircraft. And uh, he said, I better introduce myself. He's a very nice guy. I really liked him. And he said, I better introduce myself. And he said, um, you know, he was Patrick Condon, and uh, that he was uh, with, at the time, he was MI6, GCHQ, computer section. He told me. And I had a long, long chat. I was saying I'm very well indeed. And I told him to go around murdering princesses. And he just dropped his head in his chest. with no denial, no comment at all. Just dropped his head in his chest. This guy didn't look to me like he was at all happy with his job. Uh, but he was doing his job, and he did his job. Came to me in the terminal building by the baggage carousel. Uh, looked me in the eye, offered me his hand, and said, Good luck, Alan. And he meant it. I'm sure he did. So I doubt he's still with the service, quite frankly. Uh, that sort of stuff was going on the flaming time. You know, it's just horrendous. I had someone called Jenny, and I'm M.I. says, Ashford's coming to my little pub, The Raven, on the Isle of Man, in a place called Balat, I don't know, <laughs> It's a nice little pub. And there was Jenny in there, approaching me, um, to have a chat with me about various things, mostly, mostly Diana. And so I asked me why I was interested, why, why did I care? Uh, and I had a conversation about it, it was so important, boost democracy was at stake, not just the murdering of Princess of Wales for no bloody good reason at all. Um, and she said, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not quite what would it take for you to go away? Uh, and I, I, she sort of slung the to that. And what's going to happen, I said, if I break down the barriers, then I should set me. She said, I'll just, they'll just kill you. And that's the sort of background stuff I've had now. They, they ban try to bankrupt me, stop the sales of the book. Uh, in Amazon.com over there, they were almost stopped within a matter of well, a week or two. Uh, sold books, first of all, 2,000, so the first eight days. And then, shoot, stopped. Bang, they came now, like, like, just like a man, like an axe. And stopped it. And then Amazon started obviously playing ball with them over there and over here. Um, we had people trying to make it organized, organized for me, but they'd probably work it all out. I ended up going to Jeff Bezos' team and speaking to kind of Jenny, and then one called um, Brad, who finally had to go trying to sort it out for me. He came back to me after a couple of weeks and said, sorry, Alan, said, I can't help you anymore. End of story. That was the end of it. Gone. They closed it down. They destroyed I had a notice about six months ago saying, uh, your destruction order has been complete. They destroyed 600 or so hardcore books on the left over there in the States. They just destroyed them. Yeah, it seems like the path to truth is always a rocky one, and it's a continuing theme on this show. Now, I want you to be able to clear this up tonight. You do not believe that Muhammad Al-Fayed was involved in the deaths in any way. Oh, Lord, no. No, 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 no. The reason I ask is that some other authors have either hinted or blatantly stated that his involvement was a possibility. So I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that you didn't think that that was the case. No. Then, you know, I guess it's time to ask the big overarching question, 
Why do you think Diana and Dodi Fayed were killed? Why? Because basically Diana uh, loathed uh, Charles in particular at this point. Uh, they destroyed her life. She knew that. Uh, she wanted revenge. And she had the power. She had the knowledge. She had the dossier that was um, uh, published. Uh, sorry, from published. It was, it, was, it was copied and she sent it to two uh, friends of hers she could trust. Simon Simmons is one of them. Um, and try to protect her position so they couldn't get the children away from her and walk away. It would be too dangerous them to try. But if they did try, she would have just uh, brought this out and made it public. Um, she wanted revenge. Uh, she wanted to get rid now, by this point, of the royal family altogether. And she wanted to be safe when she went off with the uh, dirty fires. She wanted to be safe away from them and not be attacked by um, other forces and legislation. Well, Alan, what we do on the Midnight Writer News Show is that we shine a spotlight on authors and researchers who are doing outside-the-box work that brings real, unfiltered truth to the people. Now, I want to say right now that I believe that your version of these events surrounding the death of Princess Diana is the true version of events. Thank you. So for anyone who wants to read your work, keep up with you, contact you, how can they do so? Uh, With difficulty now, I'm afraid, Um, they can try and get um, Amazon.co.uk, the UK site, and there'll be a few books remaining on that, but they won't be long either. They're all trying to close me down there as well. And it's very, very, very tough indeed now to get them. There were some left um, in a company called um, Gardeners in the UK. They do have some books, and you can get some from there. Uh, But that's pretty well the only source left. They're just abandoned Alan Power the author of The Princess Diana Conspiracy I want to say it was an honor to have you on thank you very much Sean thank you very much for inviting me I've been enjoying being here have a good night and all best to you too bye Chicago I'm S.D. Patrick this is the Midnight Rider News Show and we'll be right back are the concentration camps being constructed in America today? How many foreign troops are on U.S. soil and why are they here? What are the Nazi links to the red, green, and blue list? And which list might you be on? Al Cuppet is an old-school truth chaser from the era of Bill Cooper, Ralph Epperson, and John Lear. If you want to hear how Al Cuppet still challenges the New World Order today, listen to episode 002 of the Midnight Rider News Show now. This is Al Cuppet talking to you, and you're on the Midnight Rider News Show, and we, we expect that you'll get your ears picked up tonight. There's some things that are happening out there, and you know about it. If you don't know about it, it's going to be a real low story show. And I again want to thank Alan Power for being on the show. Now, if you're interested in the Diana story at all, he's really an authority, and I respect his work very much. And once again, if you really want to support truth tellers worldwide, buy their books, support their websites, and let your dollars and pounds show what you really believe. Now, I have a request for you as the final thought for tonight. We've already begun thinking about 2018 and what changes we can make to both the show and the website, MidnightWriterNews.com. Therefore, we'd like to ask you, what changes would you like to see? We're keeping the underlying background music to the theme, but we're going to change the quotes used in it every year. So, is there a short quote that you think belongs in the theme? Is there a part of the show that you would like to have extended? Is there a part of the show that you'd like to see on the chopping block? What ideas do you have? If you have any ideas, questions, or suggestions for changes in 2018, we'd be more than happy to entertain them, and we are completely open to any and all of them. So please write us at MidnightWriterNews at gmail.com today with any suggestions you may have. Our next episode is an hour with Dr. Jerome Corsi, and believe me, you will not want to miss that. So from the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace. The Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick is a production of MidnightWriterNews.com. Copyright belongs to S.T. Patrick and all rights reserved. You can email us at MidnightWriterNews at gmail.com. And be sure to visit MidnightWriterNews.com for the best in alternative historical analysis. This is Leanne saying thank you for listening, have a great night, and always remember, when life throws you lemons, throw them back and demand chocolate.